Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon video, Napoleon's Great Blunder, Spain. Napoleon really, really struggles in Spain, so I'm interested to see how this video goes. Let's get into it. An Epic History TV, History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia, and sealed an alliance with Russia. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him, safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain, the so-called Continental System, or blockade designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country, and force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by Chief Minister Manuel Godoy, the queen's lover. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak and incompetently governed. And he devised a plan to seize control of the country. I talked about this in another Napoleon video, but this is how everything in the Napoleonic Wars is framed. It's framed as revolutionary ideals being spread throughout Europe, um, of the overthrowing of these monarchs that are, you know, that are oppressors and everything of that nature. None of that is true. That's what's so interesting to me about history. In the moment, it's a lot harder not to get wrapped up into these kind of political back and forth or cultural back and forth. When you look through the contextual lens of history, it is very obvious what is true and what is not. And so when you look back at these things, you can be like, oh yeah, this was this was total nonsense. This wasn't spreading, you know, revolutionary ideals, bringing the public into the fold of governance throughout Europe. This was a massive power grab by Napoleon. Now, it was a very successful power grab for a long time. The Napoleonic Wars is 90% Napoleon just stomping out all of Europe. However, when Spain gets involved into the conflict, there's this push and pull of the big advantageous you know chip that france has had is they have conscription of the masses they have the people of france fighting for france's military something that nobody else in europe is is really doing nobody in the conflict is doing when they go into spain spain you know revolts napoleon overthrows the the government basically puts his brother in charge then you have spain doing the same thing that France did. It's the masses getting involved, starting militias, joining into military groups. And so that is much, much different than these conventional back and forth armies that have been fighting the whole time. And it turns much more into what we would call like guerrilla warfare, right? And that type of war, that guerrilla warfare war, against a conventional army can be very, very successful, not just in this time period, but we see it in the modern day. It is very hard to fight guerrilla forces because everybody around you could be a civilian, everybody around you could be an enemy. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations. 
and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne, and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. Oh, how nice of him. But on the 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, immortalized by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly, shooting down dozens in the streets and executing more than a hundred by firing squad. So when you decide that you were going to take this tact with the civilians of an area, you are basically making a gamble here. So you're rolling the dice and the gamble is the fear of reprisal for the civilians will be enough that they will stop the revolts, right? They'll stop putting up resistance. That's what you're hoping for. If that roll of the dice does not work though, you are pushing more and more and more people into the revolutionary fervor, right? And so if you, if you live in Spain, you're a Spanish civilian, you basically are looking at this, uh, you know, one against the other. If we don't revolt, then we're, you know, we give up one crown for another. We're now under the heel of the French. We lose all independence, political independence, self-determination for the country. All of that is gone. If we decide to fight, we not only could be killed, everybody around us could be killed, everybody in our town or our family or whatever, they could all die if we decide to take up arms. If they still decide to take up arms, they are fighting in a totally different realm, in a totally different headspace than the French conventional army is, right? Because they know what this means if they lose. So they're in a totally different place than somebody just following orders here. And it can massively, massively turn into a huge revolution, a huge pushback by the civilians very quickly if they get that roll of the dice, if the French get that roll of the dice. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph. That summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain, and his brother Joseph entered Madrid as its new king, the Spanish reacted with fury. The French weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honor, they were godless atheists who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya and led to his famous Disasters of War series. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops. Again, here, the, the reason why these guerrilla wars, these revolutions are so different. When you look at a map, a, a military map, sure, it looks like, okay, we've got these three places surrounded, everything's going well, we're going to go in and crush the rebellion. This does not take into account anything else about the area other than where the standing military groups are, right? 
So there could easily, easily be a town or a whole region of civilians or militias or whatever that are bitterly, bitterly against the French here. And so you're in a much more precarious situation than it looks like on a map, right? Because you don't know who's around you, or maybe you do. Maybe you know that everybody surrounding you absolutely hates you and is going to try to uh, kill you uh, or poison your, your water or food sources or, or anything like that. And so it's, it's very different than two conventional armies looking at a map you know, from the fireside and putting troops here and moving lines here and all that. This is a very different thing. While the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessier at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Berlin was a humiliation for France, her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. Napoleon lost his mind over this loss. He was so pissed. France's enemies across Europe were delighted Napoleon was incandescent with fury. Yeah. The situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona and Saragossa. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a War of Independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to aid their revolt. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then, four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero. But Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France, with all their arms and plunder, using British ships. Jeez. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. Napoleon decided the only way to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November led a second invasion of Spain. Most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head-on and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, 
a 20,000-strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca, after a 300-mile march from Lisbon, with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well-trained, organised and led. As news reached Moore of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated 2nd Corps, and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sargoon on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost, and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main army from Madrid. While two French corps under Marshal Lannes began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat, planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog, through mountains, mud and bitter cold. Many fell by the wayside, as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness, except among the rearguard, which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialised light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment, and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired, making them slower to load, but much more accurate. In one legendary incident during Moore's retreat at Cacabelos, rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards, some say further. Thanks to the skill of the rearguard and the desperate pace of the retreat, the British kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris rumours of plots, and Austria mobilising once more for war. Yeah, that's the, that's the big thing here, is think about this in comparison to, you know, a hundred years later. Not, not even a hundred years later, but think about it a hundred years later, it, when, the, when the communications and the like strategic goals of all of the countries that are fighting are, you know, well established. If you know that wherever Napoleon is, he's winning, and wherever he is not, they are losing, then what is the obvious thing to do here? The obvious thing to do is for Prussia, Austria, and Russia to slam into France right now, right? Like they would already have an army going into France if there was this, you know, strategic communication between the powers, it's very slow building, but the longer that he's in Spain, this is what Napoleon's risking, and he knows that that's what he's risking. So it's kind of a precarious situation here. The emperor immediately left for France, yeah. taking many of his best troops with him, and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. 
For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. But the very next day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, taking up positions on the heights of Peñascuedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. But the broken terrain of walls, hedges and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. This is such more strategically smart than a lot of the battles that have been fought against the French so far. Even just in having reserves there to guard the flank is something that like, I, I feel like I just haven't been seeing in these videos. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to see how the tactics of this work out because it looks like the British are a little more prepared for this than the former fights against the French. And Napoleon just left and took some of his best troops with him. Around 2 p.m. the French artillery opened fire. Then Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Soult would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now he hurriedly cancelled that order, yeah. ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank, and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia and drove the French out. But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal, and he was carried back to the city. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British army from the dying moor, and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia, and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delaborde's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6pm, dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8pm. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned, but they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon, 
and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground, and two were set on fire, but overall, losses were light. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea, before surrendering. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster, or miraculous escape, is still debated. And did he abandon Spain in its hour of need, or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? Either way, Britain's only army had been saved, and would return to fight another day. Yeah, I'm curious about what y'all think about that about Britain's decision here to leave, how they got out. Um, I'm not really sure what I think about the decision here. Because Napoleon has left, because there is so much popular support in Spain, I, I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think on the decision to leave and how they left? While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula, and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. Napoleon had blundered in Spain, but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously, the injustice was too cynical, the whole of it remains very ugly. If you'd like to learn more about the peninsula... Alright, so that was Napoleon's Great Blunder Spain. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll get on to the next Napoleon video pretty quickly, and I'll see you guys then.